Hey, hello everyone. How are you? Uh, hopefully doing fine. Uh, it's been a while since I've done this, but I would really like to do this more often. Uh, ideally every week, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you can hear me. There's something wrong with my camera. Let me let me just check this. Like there there will be a lot of testing of the stream today, so. Uh, cause I have a new setup and everything is, uh, kind of falling in place. So let me, let me fix this. Hopefully that worked. Uh, we'll see. I'm still not quite in focus, but, uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, anyways, Sandy, say hi in the chat, uh, if you're, if you're there. And hopefully this this uh, camera thing won't be bugging me too much. Uh, fun fact, I was recording a video today and the camera was doing exactly this, like going out of focus. But I realized that like after recording 40 minutes of video, uh, which is uh, which is not nice because I basically didn't have uh, all the material that I worked on was, uh, yeah. Uh, as uh, as good as uh, as good as nothing um yeah this camera is still going out of focus i need to i need to figure out what's uh, what's going on um just give me a second i'll try to try to see oh marcel hi nice to see you man how have you been uh let me know what you're up to i've seen that you're going to be doing a uh, webinar soon. David, hey, hello. Uh, nice to meet you as well. Great to be, uh, it's great that you're here. Uh, hey, hey, Philip. <laughs> uh, all right. Today, I don't really have like that much planned. As you can see, I'm still trying to like figure things out. So uh, bear with me for a moment. And hopefully, hopefully I'll get this fixed. I don't know what the, what the hell is this? Why are you not focusing on me? Oh, I think I might know. Let me. I think now it might be better. We'll see. We'll see, hopefully. Uh, yeah, but good evening, good morning, uh, good day to all of you. And yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I don't have like that much planned, but there are things that I would I would love to share, and maybe I would uh, maybe we'll do some live coding. Uh, as I mentioned, I do plan talking about Cypress, Playwright, Replay.io, and uh, if you have any questions, if you're struggling with anything. Uh, we can uh, we can take a look into that. If not, we'll just you know uh, sort of improvise uh, <laughs> on uh, on this all. But uh, yeah, I still I still don't see the chat uh, on the on the video, which is uh, kind of a bummer. I just see it in the in the YouTube window window. So maybe if I maybe if I refresh this, then maybe it might work we'll see uh if not then uh yeah i'm live on youtube so you can read the other <laughs> other comments uh, as well uh okay so let's uh let's talk about let's talk about testing i have some uh i don't really have like that much content prepared but i have some like nuggets that i would love to share in fact, let me let me show you one. Uh, I've been working a lot with like test instabilities and test flakiness and 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 stuff like that uh, since I'm uh, since I joined Replay, and I hope that we can get uh, to look into that today. But uh, an interesting interesting thing happened. Like I've been I've been helping some uh, uh, companies stabilize their tests. Uh, that we have recorded through through replay and find uh, find the test flakes, and uh, and there are some really interesting cases 
that uh, that sort of uh, created instabilities in tests. I have been looking into some tests that were flaky because there was like one uh, pixel shift or whatever. Or I've been uh, looking at flakes that were uh, were caused by a wrong use of intercept. I've seen a lot of misclicks and mistypes and, and stuff like that. Uh, it's been kind of fascinating and it has sort of led me to believe that uh, end-to-end tests kind of get this bad reputation for being flaky. But I think the, there's a lot more um, that's going on in the applications as well. Uh, and we should be looking into that. Well, not only into that, but we should be taking a look at the at the system as a whole. Um, I think that uh, that would really work well uh, in, in making our tests more stable. And I think they would not have the reputation of being flaky. So um, let's uh, let's take it. Uh, let's take a couple of couple of examples. I'm going to create a new project. Let's just go take a live stream and <clears throat> and I'm going to open that file in in VS Code and I'll edit a project and we'll be doing some fiddling around with with testing. What should we what should we do? Let's do let's touch index HTML. Now let's create a something very simple. So, oh yeah, let's do button over me. And I'm going to give you an example of, uh, of a hover, hover problem. Uh, let's, let's do that. Uh, I think I might need to add some more styles into this. So let's do style tag. And we'll do something really simple. Button, and I'm <laughs> need to do some CSS here. So let's do background color. Let's do coral. That seems like a nice color. Okay, and I'm going to install Cypress here, and pm install Cypress. And oh, okay. I thought I have had the latest version installed, but it, I guess I didn't. So that's going to take a little bit of my bandwidth. Um, so let's do npx Cypress open. <clears throat> I'll just call this spec JS. All right. And yeah, let's change this. I don't really like describe blocks. Uh, do you use describe blocks? I don't don't really like them. Uh, for me, it's a it's sort of a issue with uh, with like coupling tests together uh, if I have multiple tests they usually like if I have multiple it blocks like this and they need some before each then usually that sits in one file right but uh, if I need multiple different before each functions uh, because I have different tests, right? So I have a group one and group two. And what I would need to do in order to for that before each to work properly, I would need to nest one before each in one describe block and the other before each in other describe block. And at that point, I feel like it should make more sense to split it into a separate file. Um, I don't know really what are the Cypress recommendations around this, uh, I remember when I was starting with writing Cypress tests, then uh, having the describe block was sort of a given. And then I went to a, a workshop by Gleb Bahmuto and 
he he showed he just started writing an eight block and this was surprising to me because I thought like this scribe block is uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> compulsory that you need to have that and turns out you you don't and uh, ever since I was writing my tests like this and it's kind of made sense to me so let's uh, yeah let's open that index HTML I'm never good with paths so I don't know if I should go I guess I should go dot dot I I don't know I'll, I'll just try it because I because I never know uh, oh yeah this works okay so we got the hover me let's make the button a little bit bigger well, let's have some fun with it so let's do height and do I don't know 70 pixels <coughs> that's cool uh, and do width of 200 pixels because why not cool all right so now we have a button that we can click on uh, we can hover over it uh, and we cannot really do too much uh, so let's add some logic into here uh, I'm going to add a script tag uh, script and we'll make this button interactive. So let's do, whew, I kind of forgot what uh, document uh, get element by tag name button and then put it into a constant. So let's do button and let's button add uh, how do you do the add even listener? Uh, I forgot. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess I need to Google uh, add event listener. Hope this will take me to like MDN. Yeah, MDN docs add listener method. Uh, add listener click. Add even listener. Oh, I guess I will do it. Yeah, add even listener. Let's do click. And then <coughs> we'll take the. Do we have an example here? I'm never good at. <laughs> never good at uh, reading the do the docs thoroughly, especially if someone's watching me. Uh, some element at even listener close up. I think I was doing it correctly. Button at event listener. Let's try it out. Console log clicked. And let's see. Let's see that button. Oh, at event listener is not a function. Gosh, do I have to go to. <laughs> Chat GPT, my element. I'm probably not, maybe I'm not selecting that element properly. Uh, that's what I get for writing vanilla JavaScript. Get elements by tag name. Oh, wait. Uh, get element. <coughs> Sorry. Query selector. Yes, that's that's what I wanted. Hey, there we go. So let me see if if the button is working. And clicked. All right. So now we are now we're cooking. <laughs> now we have a button that's being clicked. What I wanted to show you is a way of how you can sort of handle a hover uh, that's kind of a problem number one that many people stumble upon when they when they start uh, testing with Cypress and uh, they realize that oh actually we don't have the we don't have the hover uh, function in Cypress in fact if you go to <coughs> if you go to documentation you'll go to hover they have a doc on it but Cypress does not have a CY hover command. See issue number 10. And yeah, 
and that's yeah issue number 10 that's like i think that might be the oldest one that's uh, that's still open and there is a lengthy discussion around it and it's still being open and dmitry kovalenko has created a nice plugin cypress real events now why does this uh plugin even exist the reason for that is that uh cypress when it dispatches like events or when it tries to interact with your application then uh, it's doing everything with javascript so you can you can go get <coughs> button and then go click and that click will happen by using javascript uh, so yeah we can we can see the real hover in action and let's let's add some styles so let's do uh, button and hover and on hover we're going to change the background color to I don't know uh, should we go crazy let's do golden rot I don't know what that is but now if I refresh my page you can see oh my god that's such an ugly color uh, let's change this viewport by the way I'm not happy with that you probably don't see that all that well so let's do viewport viewport height uh, around I don't know 400 and and viewport width let's do 700 I think that might be better yeah a little bit better so now that we can we can hover and you can see that style change right uh, and there's another way uh, how this hover interaction could be uh, could be change. Uh, oh hi Dennis. Hey, how are you? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so one thing is the CSS, right? So when I define the change on my button like this, that I have this style tag or I have a separate CSS file where I hover over and that will like change some properties, then uh, then this is something that Cypress can have access. It can be accessed by the, the the plugin so let's let's maybe install it so let's do npm install install cypress real events let's go and to install the plugin i need to oh my god i'm in javascript i thought i'm in typescript ah never mind uh let's do uh require uh cypress real events and that should be enough, right? So when we do real hover, we should be good, right? Yeah, okay, so now we have the button hovered. Funny thing about this, what this plugin does, or what it cannot do, is uh, work with like a zoomed in thing. So uh, let me explain. So we have this iframe, right? And we can see that it's zoomed at 87%. And that's that's like, okay. And uh, and Cypress Real Events uh, plugin can handle that. It doesn't have a problem with that. But as soon as I do something like this, so this is my browser at 100%. As soon as I uh, uh, do a uh, something like this, when I zoom in really, uh, really closely, what can happen is that this plugin will not be able to handle the right coordinates uh, let me let me show you uh, right now it does and I think the reason for that is is that we are we are at the top left corner and there's like not else on page that uh, that would be uh, that would create a problem for it but I had situations where that uh, zoom uh, that that uh, hover effect would not work uh, would not work because the coordinates were not uh, counted properly. Uh, let me double check on that because <coughs> uh, real events. Uh, because I know that this was a open issue, and I'm not really sure if it's uh, still there. Oh yeah, it's still there. Clicks and hovers don't work if browser is zoomed. Uh, and yeah, this also hasn't been worked on. 
Uh, I guess the main reason is that uh, Dimitri was Cypress engineer at the moment when this uh, when this plugin was created. Uh, he's not with Cypress anymore, so I think there might be just like he focused on on some other stuff. Also, it doesn't work on uh, on Firefox, so that's that's another problem. All right, so let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, good question. Whether I don't need to add the require statement in the E to E JS. Uh, you're probably. Uh, oh, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, I added to the command JS. Um, didn't even think about it. Uh, not really, because E to E JS has the commands JS file imported, so it sort of hops onto the right place, right? So Cypress, what it needs to be ran is to have a support file, and uh, and it needs to have this configuration file. And those are the things that the configuration file takes uh, care of, things that happen on uh, when you launch Cypress. The e2e.js this is responsible for things that happen when you launch a test. So this is like the index file or the first file that you need to have uh, loaded, uh, that loads when you open when you open browser. And in there, and it's sort of like an entry point for for all the uh, all the plugins and everything and anything that you might need when you are running in that uh, in that browser. Um, so uh, so yeah, it could be in commands, it could be in e2ejs. I might not even need the commands JS. In fact, in real life, I'm not really using it uh, as a separate file because if I create custom commands, I usually have them in a uh, like each custom command is its in own separate file. Uh, I find that to be uh, to be easier, but uh, that's I mean that's a, that's a style choice. I wouldn't say this is sort of a standard. Uh, all right, so where was I? Oh, okay. So we have this button hover, and the only way we can interact with it is through this plugin, Real Hover, because instead of using JavaScript, the Real Hover is going to use the Chrome DevTools protocol. And the Chrome DevTools protocol, that also means that we cannot do this in Firefox. So if cross-browser testing is like very, very important for you, first of all, not sure why you would use Cypress for that, although Cypress is really cool and, I, and I'm and i a big fan, but also uh, if you need like a huge cross-browser compatibility, I guess you are testing some kind of legacy software, then uh, then I don't know if, if Cypress would be the real ch uh, really good choice. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's built more for applications of today. Like if you have a React app, Angular, Vue, whatever, um, then then it works really well. It works well with other things, but, uh, but yeah, you get the point. Um, so there is another way of how a hover effect can be achieved in... Uh, in JavaScript, in our uh, in modern web applications, and that's by adding a even listener. So, when I do mouse over <coughs> uh, mouse over, that would sort of be like a hover, but it's it's not it's not that. It's just like uh, it's different. This is JavaScript. This is CSS. We see kind of the same thing. But the way how that is implemented is different. And it's really interesting to, to see that. So let's do mouse over. And if we are on mouse over, let's change that button. Let's do the button. What can I do? Can I do style? Button style. I guess I can. Background color. Is that the way you would do that? Let's do golden rod. And I'm going to remove this or comment this out. And uh, let's refresh this. Oh, button style is not a function. That's not how how that you would do. Uh, then is uh, history is trying integrates playwright in my Cypress project, and I was wondering when <laughs> you're gonna do another session uh, about playwright. Playwright. I mean, we can do one right now. I'm still still. Uh, uh, learning about it so okay button style how do you element to do css style declaration uh how, 
how does this work? I need to Google once again. Not good at vanilla JavaScript. <laughs> uh, style. Style. Style, style. HTML element style property, SVG element, global attributes. Oh. No, that's probably not it. Uh, wait, how do you... Ah, totally forgot about how do you do this. Add property, CSS. Class name. Can we do something like this? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to do it through class. Will that work? No. Button class name is not a function. Uh, oh, that's right. Because yeah, it's it's not a function. I I get it. Uh, yeah. I we need to do it like this. Style. And then uh, background color goldenrod. Where are we? Will this work? Yeah, here we go. Uh, okay, but it doesn't really do <laughs> what I thought it would. Uh, add even listener mouse over. So this should be added when we do the mouse over. Let's do a red color because that's uh, that's going to be different. Okay, and I see that we have the thing button style color goldenrod. It is red now, so that happened. But I'm not sure why why it happened immediately because then we should have done it on mouse over right uh yeah a lot of fun trying to code <laughs> code something on mouse over uh, what if i do it on click will that make any difference oh that's right oh how could i forget i have the real hover over here so funny thing about real hover i i mentioned that if you have a css style that is taking care of that that visual change on hover, right? You're triggering Chrome DevTools protocol. What that's going to do is like simulate a real hover. So everything sort of happens, like not only the CSS thing, but also the uh, the, the JavaScript thing. So let's, let's remove this for a moment and do the change the code here on mouse over and I'm going to add another listener and do mouse out and do background color will go back to coral all right so now when I refresh the page it's going to behave exactly like like a hover right so visually for a user, this is pretty much the same. But now, if we have that, if we have the change handle handled by JavaScript, we actually can work with this in Cypress. And that's using the trigger, right? We trigger a mouse over, uh, and then we're going to say shoot. Let me change to, to have CSS background back ground color and that's going to equal to red right will that test pass oh that's actually going to need to be in rgb so let's do rgb 25500 uh made it a typo uh, zero, zero. Yeah, I forgot the closing bracket. Oh, good, right? So what happens? We select the button, we do the mouse over, 
before, after, we can see that this state changes. So since this uh, button is handled by, by JavaScript, we can do the trigger instead. We don't even need the real uh, hover uh, command, the real Cypress events. We can do it by trigger. Now, how do you tell? How do you tell between these two? Uh, well, looking at the code, it's kind of easy. If it has a CSS style, then it's handled by CSS. If it has a even listener, then it's uh, like that. Of course, most of the times when you do testing, they're not written in vanilla JavaScript. So can you tell some other way? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can, because we have dev tools and this is exactly what they are for. So when I select an element on a page, right? I select this button. I can see the button style over here and I can see what's going on with this, with this button. If I had a hover uh, state, I could see that hover state and see the different CSS properties that are on this button uh, when I do a hover. If there's something that's, if, if the changes are triggered by, uh, by JavaScript, we can take a look at even listeners. So now I have my button selected and now I can see that the mouse out and mouse over, those two events that I have registered over here are present. Uh, and uh, if you want to sort of reverse engineer, if you want to select an element and find out on whether that is that has some uh, uh, even listeners, then this is the way you can you can see that. Uh, by the way, by default, usually this ancestors is clicked on, and it sort of like watches for everything. And I don't know why there are so many of these, but I think by default they are they just are. So you need to unclick that. So you'll see only the element. And this is also kind of kind of good thing to find out which element on the page is interactive. Because this leads me to another problem that we often have when testing. Let's say you have a button like this. And I'm going to answer your questions in a, in a moment because I see chat uh, doing its thing. Uh, right? So we can have something like this. The button looks pretty much the same, right? But now it's actually two elements, right? Now we have, if we inspect that, take a look at the elements panel, we'll see that we have button and there's span inside. So what many people might do is that instead of targeting the button, they'll accidentally target the span element which is like not the worst thing because Cypress takes good care of you in that case. It tries to make sure that that when it triggers, for example, a click event that it's going to, it's going to register with that button as well. Uh, but there is something funny happening uh, with this. And uh, let me show you, let's, let's do another thing. Let's do a P like this. Let's select the P element or the paragraph and we're going to do button at even listener and on click whenever there's a click we are going to uh, change the inner text right so let's do p inner text it's going to be equal to button was clicked <coughs> But also, we're going to add a disabled attribute on this button. So now when I save the page and refresh that, oh, my test is going to be failing. So let's just comment this out. Uh, not this thing. Right, we're clicking on it. Nothing is happening because the button is disabled. If I remove the disabled property, refresh the page, then I, when I click on it, you can see the message button was clicked. Now, let's put this disabled property back. So if I go and select the button, CY get button and click on it, you'll see that the test is trying it out and eventually it will fail. 
it's going to say, oh, I could not click on this. This button is disabled. Therefore, I'm not going to even try. If you want me to, do the force through, right? So if I do that, force through. If I do that, that's going to work. Button was clicked. Uh, can refresh that because we didn't saw that. Uh, yeah, button was clicked even though it was disabled. So this is what the force through will do for you. It will force the click. Now, there's one thing. If I go ahead and select the span, I don't need to do the click and uh, the, the force through. Let me save that. Try to run again. You'll see button was clicked even though the uh, the element, uh, the button element was disabled. Because what we were targeting was this span text inside. So when Cypress performs these checks on whether an element is uh, is interactive, uh, whether it is not covered by other element, it will do that for the element you're selecting. Uh, which is kind of funny, because if you are targeting an element on page and you're not targeting the right one, you might get into a result where you will get that, uh, get to the state you want, button was clicked, but you don't get to it the right way. Uh, and this can leave, uh, this can lead into like small instabilities and flakiness and, and problems with the, with the test because you're trying to force the application to do something that the real user would not be doing. Interestingly enough, if there was something happening in the background of the, uh, of the application, let's say you're loading something, there are some resources being loaded, uh, you might be interacting with the application before it is even interactive. Let me demonstrate that. I'm going to change this code now. And I'm going to take that button and I'm going to set timeout. And in the timeout function, after two seconds, I'm going to say that the button, uh, huh. What's the property? No, uh, attribute. Yeah, get attributes. Uh, I'm going to get attribute that's called disabled. Uh, duh, duh, duh. No, 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 no. I want to remove attribute. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. I'm going to remove this attribute after two seconds, right? So let's save this. I'm going to run my test. Button was clicked. And let's let's just not click the button. That's going to be a little better for demonstrating. Let's just comment this out. And just going to load this application. And, and hopefully you can see this, but there's the hover me text. You'll see that it's sort of semi-transparent and then it appears. Those are the those two seconds, you see? Oops, <laughs> I was hovering over me and now it appears, right? So when we do the get span click, even though the button is disabled and eventually it will be enabled, we still get test uh, in under, uh, in like 100 milliseconds. So we did the interaction even though the application wasn't ready. Uh, and this is a problem because we might be clicking on a button that's not interactive. Maybe there is some JavaScript function. There's some JavaScript logic or some asynchronous logic that will that will take a little bit of time to, to get loaded and then the, the, the element would be interactive. Uh, and we do this as testers all the time because we're not really looking at the code. Uh, and kudos to you if you do that. I think that's, that's great because the better understanding we get of the internals of the application, the better decisions we can make on those on those tests. Uh, so let's uh, let's let's change this. Change this, right? If we if we target the button instead of the span, right? Now my test is going to do just fine. It's going to keep on retrying, and it's going to click on that element, right? Uh, and if it's going to take a little bit longer, then of course we get into trouble. So if we change this timeout from two seconds to, to I don't know, five seconds, 
and we run the test. Now we get into trouble because by default Cypress is going to be retrying for four seconds. And since that button becomes active after five seconds, we're going to, the test is going to fail. So what we can do is to make sure that this chain of commands where we're trying to query a button and then click on it, we're going to give the querying part a little bit more time. So let's do a timeout and let's change that to six seconds, right? And now we're hovering, it take, uh, takes a, a little bit longer time. Wait, uh, wait, should I have put the timeout on the on the click wait timeout i guess i should have oh yeah wait why oh okay i'm confusing it yeah uh the reason why i thought i need to do uh it on the get button is that you actually need to do it like that on when you're using a shoot command because shoot is going to make the previous query chain uh to retry and uh, but click doesn't do that, so we actually need to put the click in there. All right, that's just like a side note. But if we do that, we get timeout of six seconds. Now we have enough time for that uh, element to load. Eventually, we click on it. Our test is passing, so that's great. Usually, also this is something like this timeout thing. Uh, I've seen I've seen people doing something like this. Let's do CY visit, and then we wait. And we wait for, I don't know, 10 seconds should be enough for our test uh, to, for our application to load everything. Uh, I'm not a fan of this. Uh, it solves the problem. It is a quick fix, but what you can do is instead just select the first element and then wait for it for however long you need, right? And that timeout is going to be your upper threshold. So obviously we can wait for six seconds uh, we can wait for 30 seconds and that 30 seconds is the upper boundary like we're not going to wait for more than 30 seconds if if we if we're going to do that we can safely assume that our page is down and this test should fail anyway so uh but when the button is active within the window of 30 seconds then our test is obviously going to take less because Cypress will sort of move on to the next command as soon as it is finishing with the uh, with the second one. All right, so now we have looked into the interactivities, etc. Uh, I want to show you one thing, and that's contains, which is I mentioned this a couple of times. It's my favorite command because if I do cy contains uh, hover me. Right. If I'm going to do CY contains that whole trouble of select of whether I should be selecting the button element or the span element and trying to find out which is interactive, that goes away. Uh, if I do click, even though it is the span element that contains that text, contains command is intelligent enough to find out that, all right, I want to click on something, but that thing that I found needs to be clickable. So when I do that, uh, oh, I actually set the timeout for uh, four or five seconds, right? So let's change that in the code for two seconds. <clears throat> so when I do that now, the button is going to be clicked and we have that wait, we have that period. We are waiting for that element to be ready which is great. And if I take a look into the contains command and look into what it was yielding, what, what the element was finding, it is actually going to prefer the button element over the span, which I think is, uh, is a great choice. Uh, it's intuitive. Uh, it potentially might lead to some trouble, but I, I don't see that happening, uh, honestly. So yeah. Uh, okay, you can style the, but, but you have to have properties. All right, which solution is better to use with real events solution or the trigger? That's the thing. Um, you should use 
the solution that fits, right? So the trigger can trigger these events, right? What trigger is doing, it is triggering these events like click, right? Or mouse over or mouse out or whatever element, whatever event is defined in the, in the code or whatever uh, event you can actually see in the, in the dev tools, in the event listeners, right? I could, I could even go trigger click if that's what I want. Uh, if you have something that's only handled by CSS, then real hover is your only choice. Now, my experience with the real hover command is that it has some, it has some problems. It is a good solution. I would say it is 90% there, right? If I'm ignoring the whole not available in Firefox, which I am, um, it, it does have, um, a problem here and there. If you if you use real hover, for example, you're not going to get a snapshot, right? If I move all along the timeline and hover over and, and uh, see where we were actually clicking on, I can see that. You don't get that information with real hover. And as I mentioned, there are some troubles with, with uh, like targeting the element if the page is uh, zoomed in uh, and you, you have sort of like no way of find, finding out uh, like where the hover was actually triggered. I think so. Uh, there might be some information, but it is really hard to like find out where it actually was. So yeah, so that's that. Um, also, uh, I've seen some cases over past couple of days where where the real hover would not, uh, I mean, as the test was moving way too fast and there were things rendering and animating and stuff was happening all over the page uh, as elements were hovered, there was some problem. There was some flakiness with that. I think it had to do something with the animation being, uh, being done or something with not being properly loaded or, or whatever. But it didn't. It uh, it didn't work as well as you might expect. So, yeah. I mean, overall, it's a good solution, but it's 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 not hundred percent. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I guess maybe that might be a reason why Cypress never implemented it. But I don't know. Um, so yeah. Uh, all right. That that was uh, that was a lot about about selectors and uh, not not selectors like uh, commands and timeouts and interactivity, but I thought like this this might be a really really useful tip uh, on um, uh, on yeah on like whatever. Okay, I I had another thing in mind with uh, with this hover thing. Uh, uh, do, 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 what was it? Never mind. If if you have questions, feel free to ask. I'd be I'd be happy if we can make this, uh, make this interactive. I know I sort of didn't answer the the couple of last messages uh, right away, but uh, but yeah, we can just we can just chat. Um, all right. What's the? I want to do. I want to play with that trigger again. Uh, we had that mouse over and we had the button style change, right? Background, background color uh, was red. And then background color was back to the original color which was, what was it, Coral? I love these names. <laughs> and I, I'm really interested in the story of like, what was the story behind like giving CSS colors their names? Uh, maybe there is something. 
uh, what is the story behind CSS color names? Where does the, did the CSS name colors come from? Da, da, da. This is not the setup colors of the month where we mentioned one of the one, 140 name colors. Uh, this works out to more than 12 years worth of meetups, blah, blah, blah. We became a co organizer. Where's that picking? The, the, the Spitznow. Some of the familiar names. What do the specifications say? There is a specification called col CSS color module level that is currently in draft status and defines color related properties and values that already exist in CSS. Da -da -da. How this talk might be might be interesting. So deep dive into color two to two software developer. Did I miss it? <laughs> There's like a lot of here. <laughs> Paint color names. We won't be able to figure out why snow has a red hue, but it does beg the question of how paint companies name their colors. Why did CSS use the X11 colors? All the discussion around the development of CSS specification takes place in the open, so it's possible with some patience to dig up relevant discussion threads. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't think we have a time for that. But orange. CSS2 turns out color orange for lots of tests in CSS which da, 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 just supported just fine. However, because orange was never a color name in CSS1, it was technically invalid CSS. Interesting. That's mostly discussing the the snow with reddish hue. So snow is red, apparently. <laughs> Tomato colors. Yeah, these things are fascinating. The the whole history of people that built the internet of today and, <laughs> and all the funny quirks around that. Uh, I like that. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go back to the <laughs> to the thing. Uh, the the trigger, right? Uh, so I had a interesting case where. I would have, oh wait, it was actually a little bit more complicated because there was there was a drag and drop simulation in uh, in that test. And yeah, basically I was examining a test where there was a, a table that would have like a graph and you could select a range that uh, that would select a certain amount of months, you know, like a range from January to July or whatever. And that test was starting to fail because there was a slight change in that table. And the way that was, uh, the way why that was happening, like the, the test would say, oh, I don't have the right date range. Uh, and the reason why that was happening was because the table suddenly had a thicker border around it. And because of the trigger uh, command and sort of simulating the drag and drop events was uh, selecting the coordinates, like the deterministic coordinates of a, uh, of a element. So it was like 347 uh, comma 285, something like that those coordinates would get shifted because of that border. And now that test would not be selecting the same date range, range as it was before because the application changed and now the border is, is different. Uh, that was kind of a funny story. Uh, but I think that the end-to-end -end testing is kind of full of these stories. And sometimes we get to figure, it, figure them out and sometimes we don't. And uh, that can be kind of kind of frustrating right like why why is my test failing why is this why is this happening and this was the reason why i was kind of uh uh 
excited to join Replay because what Replay did, uh, what it is doing for end-to-end -end, uh, testing and for testers and SDETs around the world is giving them a tool that uh, can help you find out uh, about stuff like this. Uh, on this live stream, I have shown um, uh, shown a video about like sort of a race condition uh, that was uh, that was happening in one of the applications where you would have add to cart and and add to cart button, but also that page would be loading uh, availability of items uh, on on a sort of like e-commerce store, and if you click that add to cart button too soon which would easily happen uh, on an end-to-end -end test, then uh, you would essentially try to buy zero items and the server would, would give you an error for that. Uh, and yeah, uh, and it was, a, it was kind of a fun thing to find, uh, find out about uh, with Replay. In fact, I do have some, I do have some examples. Let me, let me show you. Uh, I have this project, Cypress Flakiness Debug Examples, that I have been working on let me let me screen share that and uh, I actually have a playwright test in here so let's switch to playwright for a moment uh, do -do 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 -do. yeah customer subscriptions let's do CD customer subscriptions npm run dev I'm going to <clears throat> open localhost yeah hello there. So this is this is like a CRM kind of a site, and when I refresh that, I get this message like, "Hello there, we have a brand new user experience that will make you ten times more productive." Right, marketing team doing God's work. They can go try a new experience, and that does nothing because it's just like a dummy application that I made for myself. And now we have. Let's go to the playwright test. So we have playwright test, and that test is making sure uh, that we have all of the accessibility standards going well, right? So let's let's run this, right? And now it has failed because it has found accessibility issues, and you can read all about them over here. I have the trace viewer on, maybe. That's uh, maybe let's turn it off for a moment. Okay, okay. Let's uh, run this. Actually, it's a side panel I want to have. If I run it a couple of times, yeah, we can get to a past result. So I'll run it once, I ran it twice, third time. Well, it's now all passing, maybe. Yeah, and now it's failing. Okay, fun. <laughs> All right, so let me back up and tell you what this test is doing. Uh, I found this in the Playwright documentation. There's this X core uh, plugin that will that will analyze the page and try to find any kind of accessibility issues. So the way it it does is you open the page and then you analyze the page and then you make sure that there are no violations. It should be an empty empty array. And usually it is, but sometimes it isn't. So how do you how do you debug this? Like, okay, so we got we got a message and we have an object and we have some elements on the page that do not meet the standards. Uh, so obviously it seems like okay, we have some errors, so we should fix those. But where are those errors? What is happening here? Um, it's it's not like it's not enough information on uh, maybe it's in enough information on where it is happening because I think we can let me let me try again to make this test fail and in the error message you will get information on like what are those elements that are not accessible right that are not proper here we go. We can see that I think there's a ID button has this. No, that's not ID of the element. Critical area able does not exist or is empty. Does it actually show the element? <coughs> Wait, it doesn't. 
Oh, it does. HTML button class, absolute top, right? <laughs> right to. Okay, that's fun, right? <laughs> uh, we have the element. Now, where do we find it, right? We can select this, try to find the element, see what's going on. Let's let's actually do that. Let's actually try to find that element. I'm going to paste it over here. I'm going to remove that. Quotes, can we find this? No, we cannot. Can I maybe just find at least a list of those classes? Yeah, all right. Here we go. Here we have the modal, right? We have the modal uh, component in here. And we found the element that has the accessibility violation. All right, so we can fix that. But now as a tester, I'm more interested in, in into the problem like, why was this test even passing? This is not good, right? This is not what we want. Uh, we don't want the test to be passing if it has that violation. So how do we find out what is going on here? Let me show you. I'm going to open a new terminal. And what should I do? Okay, I need to... I want to set this project up, right? Because right now what I get, I get the accessibility report printed out in the terminal, but I don't really get too much insight into, into what is happening actually like during the test. I do have the trace viewer. I can, I can use that. Let's turn it on. Maybe I can finally learn to work with that. <laughs> um, okay, so the trace viewer is fun. It is a good expansion to the playwright ecosystem, right? But as I walk through that, I am still not sure what is going on. Like we have this frame evaluate. I think these are parts of the, of the accessibility uh, thing. But if you, if you look at the top here, you can see that as I go through this, they don't really go chronologically. So it's kind of hard to find what's going on. Oh, they do go chronologically. Wait, why was it? Okay, maybe they do go chronologically. I'm sorry. I thought they, they don't because there was some confusion. I didn't get it. Didn't really get what is what is going on. Oh, I know what, what what threw me off is the fact that when we go to page and then we do the evaluation, we see those elements, we see the page. And then if I go lower, I see a blank page. So I think there is some, um, yeah, Playwright sort of closes the page before the analysis is finished. So when that expect to equal happens, when you go to that error, you don't actually see what's going on with the error. And that's, that's sort of what threw me off. Maybe I just need to uh, work with this uh, a little more to get more familiar. But it is kind of counterintuitive. And I have been, um, as I mentioned, I am a fan of Cypress, but I see Playwright is on the rise. Uh, I think it's going, to, uh, it's going to continue on growing. And I think this might be the year where it will surpass uh, Cyprus. In fact, I, I think I mentioned that somewhere. Yeah, I mentioned that on LinkedIn, but I think it might be interesting to, to see the graph again. So this is the NPM trends, Cyprus versus Playwright. If you take a look at the two years trend, uh, maybe let's take a five years trend. Wait, this is not uploading, updating. Five years. Yeah, let's do five years, right? So Cyprus was rising to the top, uh, um, beautifully growing. And the last year, you can see the growth kind of, like you can see the year two, uh, 2022 was still going up. 2021 was the year of Cyprus. 2023, you can see that line sort of flat lines or the growth goes really m much, much slower than, than before. We're looking at the weekly downloads uh, from NPM. And then if we take a look at Playwright, you can see 2021, it was kind of nowhere. It was growing though. 
then 2022 it was growing uh, again kind of faster than the last year and then 2023 the first half it continued on that growth and the second half it just like crazily jumped up i don't know what what that is it almost looks like anomaly but you can see that that playwright is really growing so i think I think this is the year, the 2024 is the year where these two lines will meet. You can kind of see them meet here, but this is insignificant. Like this is the the New Year's dip uh, that happens every year. So this is not significant, but I think over the summer, maybe in the fall, September, October, those two lines will actually meet. Uh, and we'll see like where that goes from there. It's actually interesting to see some other tools as well so for example webdriver io if we add it uh into here if we add webdriver io you can see that this has been sort of steadily at those like around 1 million numbers and it's still keeping those numbers and i've seen like people that are using webdriver io or are contributing it to it are like really really passionate about the tool and one day i'll probably do a stream about webdriver io uh try to find out what it is about uh, but you can see it sort of it, it, it keeps their uh, their base uh, their their user base. Now what's what's kind of funny and surprising to me because I don't hear puppeteer being uh, mentioned that often. If I add puppeteer to the bunch, it's kind of funny. It's the green light now, a uh, green line now. The web driver IO is is now red. You can see that Puppeteer is growing, growing a lot. Uh, I don't hear people using Puppeteer for for testing. I think Puppeteer is being used a lot as, I don't know, I, and I don't know if I'm right about this, but I think Puppeteer is being used sort of as a peer dependency in many packages. Not sure if in Cypress as well, like right now they are building some sort of plugin that is supposed to help you with with multiple tabs uh, and is going to be utilizing um, util utilizing Puppeteer, but this is not what, what we're seeing here. We can see that Puppeteer is sort of on the rise and it's going up and down like crazy. Uh, but it's kind of funny to see that because I never hear anyone talking about Puppeteer as a testing tool. So I think the, 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 the green line might actually signify something else because I think I think I saw a couple of articles about Puppeteer being used for like web scraping. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the usage is much, much wider than um, uh, than what uh, than testing. Um, yeah, OK, this was a segue. But I, what I wanted to show you is is this this uh, test, right? This accessibility test that we that is failing for us. Uh, so how do we get more insight into what, what is happening? Um, and this is where I want to show you replay, because I think this is exactly where it shines. Uh, I need to go to the docs, <laughs> because I don't remember everything. But if you go to the docs and go to the test suites, you'll find all about how to set up replay for your framework of choice. We even have Selenium. I worked on that document uh, uh, a while ago. And in fact, we're going to be doing a live stream with uh, Nikolai Advolotkin uh, and on, on setting replay with a Selenium test suite. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm not even sure if that's going to work. Like I, I am sure it's going to work. I'm not even not sure if we're going to be able to make it work. Uh, so that's, it's, you see, it's, it's a skill issue, not, not a possibility issue with Selenium, basically what we are doing here. And this is like a Node.js implementation of Selenium, which is not that popular because usually you write your Selenium tests in Java. Uh, so that's why it is a little bit different, but the whole principle is to tell Selenium, Hey, don't record with Chrome or Safari or whatever you just chose. Record with Replay Chromium. That's a browser that we have built or that the team in, at Replay has built. And uh, and it has a cap capability to capture and record everything that's happening uh, in the application. 
And that's going to become handy in our test over here. So let's go to Playwright. Uh, let's do the installation. Where is my terminal? Here we go, CD customer subscriptions. Let's install Playwright and then <coughs> we have to do the projects. Uh, where are we? Yeah, we do the import. Then we do the reporter. Where do we have the reporter? Here we go. I think I have my API key set up, hopefully. And then projects. This is where you would like set up your, your different browser projects. So what I'm going to do here is to set up just one project and that's going to be replay chromium so instead of chrome and safari and firefox that's there by default i'm going to use this browser all right so now all i need to do there's the api key blah 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 all i need to do is to call npx playwright test project replay chromium and that's going to give me that recording that I can then access with uh, with Replay DevTools. So let's, let's see if we can make it work. Oops, that's not what we want. Uh, I wanted to copy this. Let's see. Ooh, that's not what we want. What's going on? Cannot find module Replay IO Playwright. Oh, wait, what did I do? I didn't install it. NPM install replay IO playwright. Oh yeah, okay. I think there was an error. Uh yeah, there is a there is a dependency lock at the moment. Like you need to use sort of like an older version of playwright if you want to be sure that everything works i don't want to get into details of that it's not uh, so, yeah okay i will <laughs> we currently have have two browsers at replay we have the firefox and we have the chromium now the firefox we're trying to slowly steer away from because chromium is actually going to perform much better and it's like overall it's going to be much better experience so the lock of the of the dependency which is now throwing errors at me is about the fact that that the version that i'm installing is st still supporting both chromium and firefox but i don't really care about that i just want to do chromium so i did the npm install playwright force so i ignored the uh the warnings that are here and now have finally installed everything so let's do now npm not npm install i want to run that project okay and now it's running my test it has failed yes that's what i wanted and it's now uh failed yeah the, the test has failed and i have uploaded the recording so you can think of replay in the context of of tests as a as a reporter right you're going to get report from your tests but it is much more because it's not like it's not a, a reporter. If you want to use it just like reporter, just as reporter, you're missing out on all the amazing capabilities. I'm opening that link to re the report from uh, from our test, and what I get here is first of all, I can just view this as a video. I can see my test. It's it's one second long, so it's very very short video. Uh, fun fact. It is not a video. <laughs> I call it video because people usually understand when I show it to them as a video. But what it is, is actually a capture of what was happening in the browser. So if I go, oh, we actually don't have like too much interactivity. But if I had like click and type and whatever, you could see those in, uh, in here. Right now, you can see the commands that were executed, sort of like in the, in the, in the trace viewer, right? You see the go to page evaluate browser context whatever all that fun stuff we have seen in the uh in the uh, in the trace viewer 
Now, what's really fun is that you can uh, examine your test code. So remember, I entered a modal TSX, right? Uh, a modal component. Now what I can do, so now we're getting to the it's not a reporter part, uh, because not only we can see the test, but we can jump into the code. Uh, I think there might be a better demonstration for this if I had like click and type, because if I have a click command, uh, especially like in Cypress, if I have a click and type command, I can, uh, there's a button that will, that literally says jump to code. And if your test was clicking on something, it will take you to the source code, to the exact line that was executed uh, as the test was clicking your application. So it will show you what part of code was executed. Uh, here in this model, you can see that I have the, the code, right? The exact code I had in, in uh, my VS code, right? So it has captured that. And in this gutter, you'll see that we have uh, the number of lines of like how many times this line of code was actually executed, right? So we see that this was executed two times. Let me make it bigger for you, right? So this line of code was executed two times. This one line of code was executed once. And we have that for every file uh, in, the whole, uh, in the whole test, right? So what I can do, I can go ahead and just jump to the exact point where this line was executed, I, I pressed command on my on my keyboard. I pressed command and this would take me to the first in instance this line, this if is open, whatever uh, was executed, right? And you could see that in a video or video, right? Uh, that the the thing has changed. We can see now the, the modal uh, appearing. And I can go to the next instance and sort of jam, jump back and forth. Uh, all right, <clears throat> this is this is not all. The but I think the the connection between the test code and the application code is really powerful one, because now if we have a flaky test, we don't only add weights and shoots and assertions and whatever to our test code we can actually fix the issue that's inside the application code because we can get some insight. And I'm going to show you how to get some insight, right? So it actually shows for, for me right now, you'll see that as I hover over whatever variable there is in, uh, in my code, for, like, for example, like this is open, that can either be true or false. I have this pop-up uh, show, show up. There we go, let me show that again. And you can see that at this moment, at this exact moment in the in the one second period of time where that uh, test was running, at this exact moment, this line of code was true, right? If I go, can I go back? Can I see it being false? I think no. I think it was just open uh, during both. Uh, uh, it was true during both time of this uh, of this line uh, being executed. But yeah, let's say your test is running during a period of time and you have different variables that can change because you can open a modal window and you can close a modal window and it's going to be true or false or whatever during that time. Now, replay captures everything that was happening so you can see the moment when this was true, you can see when this the, the moment when this was false and you can stop at any moment and for example, uh, examine elements on the page, right? Uh, you can examine React components, and I'm getting to the <laughs> to like a lot of unnecessarily uh, unnecessary details <laughs> because what I'm trying to trying to do here is to find out why this accessibility uh, test was failing, uh, or rather why it was passing. I think that's that's kind of a more uh, more important thing. Now. Uh, I kind of wondering how I would look into that in this case. I think this is this is where we get to the improvisation part <laughs> of wait, we were improvising from the beginning. But I think we can I wonder if we can sort of find the moment when that 
when that uh, element, when that accessibility was actually being executed. I think I might not be able to do that. I, I had a similar case where I was doing that with Cypress and the situation was kind of different with, uh, with Cypress versus Playwright because Playwright has its test code inside the uh, inside Node. It executes everything from Node. Uh, Cypress is kind of unique uh, in this regard because it is executing everything in, from inside the browser. So in replay, we can actually see the the, the Cypress code and the uh, and the test uh, um, yeah the Cypress code and the application code that's being loaded in the browser. In Playwright, we don't have that inside just yet, but it is being worked on. So you could actually pair the I don't know, like selectors and actions and everything uh, with the moment uh, on the, with a certain moment in a test. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's see. But I do have like some sort of timeline in here because we can do the, you can see the frame evaluate. Does it take me? No, I don't know. Um, Can we find the X or whatever? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, but I don't see the the accessibility check in here. So maybe this was not the best <laughs> best example to show uh, super powers or replay of replay. Actually, no. Actually, I can show you a lot. Let's let's take a look. So. I wanted to get to the to the problem that uh, that made our test pass and that made our test fail. The the long story short is that in this test, where is it? In this test that we have over here, the X builder will take with will analyze the the page. And the reason why this test is flaky is that we don't actually wait for anything to appear on the page. Uh, or we rather we don't actually wait for the modal window to appear on the page, but rather we do the analysis immediately. So if the model is quick to appear, our test is going to fail because it is the modal window that has those problems, right? It has those class names. Uh, it has those buttons that don't have the area labels and, and whatnot. And, um, uh, if the model appears soon enough, then our test is going to fail. If it doesn't appear soon enough, then it's going to it's going to pass. Uh, so essentially, what we are getting is a false positive. A test that should ideally fail all the time, but it does pass sometimes. And usually, the tendency of us testers is to make sure that we can have all of our tests green and they all work right. Uh, but uh, that's, yeah, that's not always what we should want because sometimes we get a false positive and, and having that error actually signals that there is something wrong with the page. Uh, so we should probably focus on fixing that issue instead of trying to fix, uh, uh, fix the test. And, and this is like a very slight but very important uh, shift, right? Because if we have... Uh, if we just focus on fixing the test, we might get into into trouble. And it's often being said that, oh yeah, the tests are flaky, right? The tests are flaky, we need to fix the tests. Uh, but it's not always the tests, right? Sometimes it is the application that's that's being flaky and we need to focus on that. Now, we also need to have tools that are capable of, of giving us that insight. And I think Replay IO is the tool. Um, <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, one thing I want to mention is that m we have a couple of people in this chat and maybe tell me if you had that experience in, in the past, but I did have a experience where I would run my test, I would see that test fail, I would look at the test, I would look at the video or a screenshot from the test. I would be 100% sure that I did everything I can on my part. 
and I would still not get a uh, I, I would still not be able to to do anything about it because if I showed it to a developer, they would say, "Oh, you know, like just make the test go slower or fix something on your side because I don't know what's happening. Uh, I have no way of finding out. I, if I run the test, it's going to pass sometimes for me. Sometimes it's going to fail for me, but I, I I just don't know what's happening. And me as a tester, I would say, well, me neither. I just know that it it is a problem in the application. So can we do something about it? And unfortunately, the answer was no, because what we are doing when we are writing end-to-end -end tests, essentially, we are trying to integrate two systems, right? We have the application, the system that is being built, uh, the system that is being built by developers, and then we have the end-to-end -end tests, which is a system that's being built by testers or sometimes developers, depends on the uh, on the setup in your team. So we have two systems and we try to integrate them together. So now we're sort of stuck in the integration hell where the tests that are trying to interact with the application and have some assertions about the application don't pass because there is something, something very much hidden from us that is wrong, but we will never able, uh, we were, but we would never able never be able, <laughs> but we would never be able to to find out what's going on because yeah like how how can you debug this uh, if you do that manually it just works right if you run a test then that's going to break it uh, and that's that's kind of a problem right with like robotics and automation and whatever if you do something manually yeah you can do stuff manually that's going to work if you try to automate stuff that's like whole another story uh, into making sure that it, it works as intended. Um, so yeah, I, I guess <laughs> I guess that's uh, uh, that's that's the story of of uh, of, uh, of insight into into tests. All right. Uh, let's see what the chat is working on. Uh, I don't see anything happening in the chat. Uh, you've been awfully quiet, <laughs> but that's okay. You don't you don't need to talk if you if you don't want to. Um, let's take a look. I was thinking of of uh, <coughs> trying to trying to jump into my Discord channel. I think that might be a good idea. Yeah. Jump into my Discord channel and try to see if we can maybe look into some issues that are that are being here. So here we have Cypress X package. Oh yeah, the the UI plugin. So uh, we can skip this. Uh, basically, the person was asking about uh, integration of. Uh, like Lighthouse uh, for accessibility testing because there is a package that's called uh, Cypress Audit. Yeah, I guess this is the one. And it has some trouble. Uh, the person wanted to use something else. Uh, and yeah, and Mark Noonan, who's an amazing guy from Cypress, uh, suggested using Cypress X package. Uh, Cypress is actually working on accessibility on like providing their own accessibility solution. They're working with the X maintainers uh, and, and uh, yeah, trying to provide a good um, accessibility solution for your test that's going to be like built in uh, in Cypress. I don't know like really too much details, but it is going to be quite uh, quite interesting. I think in the Cypress, uh, Cypress conference, uh, it was also announced that there would be like some sort of coverage uh, as well, and the coverage is like not the, not the code coverage, but an interactivity coverage. So if you have selected an element or interacted with an element or whatever, it's going to like show up, and and you will see what's uh, what's going on in the test. I think that's kind of interesting. I'm really curious to see how how that will work and how useful it will be. Uh, okay, we got a question about. 
emoji, uh, Cypress emoji. Yeah, there is no Cypress emoji uh, for a LinkedIn profile or whatever. I've seen, yeah, I've seen the, the evergreen tree, uh, which I think is sort of the punchline of Cypress, that Cypress is a evergreen tree that is green throughout whole year. And that is that is supposed to be the the experience you have with Cypress. Uh, oh, we know that this is not true, <laughs> but they they done a great job of of uh, moving testing to like a whole another level, and I think that's uh, that uh, yeah that deserves credit. Uh, so it's not evergreen, but it's is definitely a nice experience. Uh, this was an interesting one. Murad was asking about IPYNB files. So he's working in Python and one and IPYNB files are some sort of a mm, notes format uh, for writing notes in Python. I don't know uh, what that is, but but I was kind of surprised to see that someone is even like trying to connect Python and Cypress because Cypress, like the whole thing of Cypress is that it is running your tests inside the browser. Now, Python doesn't run in browser, as far as I know, uh, but uh, but it can sort of jump from the browser to the node environment where you can do anything. And not even the node environment, you have a cyexec uh, command that can just execute commands in like your bash terminal and then wait for the output and work, bring that back to to browser and do something with that. So I think this was the, uh, this was the flow. Um, it's kind of interesting. I was wondering on whether uh, whether Cypress is being used exclusively for these Python files, uh, or whether it was uh, uh, it was used for something else as well. I'm just realizing I'm not really sharing my screen, so this is kind of weird, right? Uh, <laughs> let's 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 do that. Uh, yeah, so I'm going over these issues and trying to see what's uh, what's going on. Uh, anyways, if you if you need uh, if you need help with anything Cypress related, the community is fairly large, relatively active. Uh, so if you if you're running into trouble or want to share something or whatever then uh, this is the place to be. There's also Cypress community. I recommend checking out that. I think it's uh, more active. Uh, there's a lot of, a uh, lot more messages going in. I think so. I don't know. I haven't checked it in for a while, but I think it's kind of active. So uh, so yeah, but people ask for help in, in here as well. Uh, yeah, programmatic uh, login into Auth0. That's, that's fun. Uh, hey, I haven't really, yeah, I haven't really answered this one. The Auth0, Cypress has their docs on how to log in programmatically. I think this is one of the hurdles that basically just happens when you are in Cypress. Since we are locked in the browser and in fact in the, the, the browser iframe, we are kind of locked into, into like what the browser iframe allows you to do. So if you are dealing with login that opens another window or is like doing some uh, some uh, complicated stuff, then then yeah, you, you are going to have trouble. The, the way how Cypress sort of uh, um, encourages you to do is to, again, jump out from the browser and do the whole dance of uh, logging in through Note or rather I should say through CY request. Funnily enough, CY request is triggered from Chrome, uh, from Chrome, from, from Node. So if you are doing programmatic login, you're not doing it inside the browser, you're sort of doing it outside the browser. Uh, which is, by the way, which is interesting. I'm pretty sure that when you have, when you have Playwright, how do you do requests in Playwright? Request, here we go. I am pretty sure that when you do request in Playwright, you are actually doing that from the browser. Or rather you are calling the, the, the browser API to do the request, but I, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, so, uh, so I don't know. But, uh, 
Yeah. Um. Is it uh, returns the frame? I don't know. I think that frame thing kind of threw me off because you are when you are using the the request. There's and there's a service worker. I don't know. I need to spend more time on this to really understand what's going on. But I think at one point I, I was kind of surprised to see that the request you are doing is actually like being sort of done in a browser. I'm not sure if that's... Now that I think about it, I, I don't think it sounds right because you would probably run into course issues, right? Yeah, and I don't see anything about course being uh, happening in here. So, yeah, I'm probably wrong about that. Yeah, I'm probably wrong about that. But I don't know. I would, I would like to see. Wait, someone is doing API testing in Playwright. <clears throat> oh, we even have the API testing here. Uh, which I thought was kind of interesting use case. Request get repo issues data title body. Oh, okay. I uh, I guess it's kind of straightforward. Maybe I was just like complicating things in my head. What I think uh that um I think this is where. I would need to try it out, but I think this is where the difference between Cypress and Playwright might be interesting one to explore because uh, Cypress with their with their chaining syntax, uh, I think it for me it always made sense. Uh, it sort of forced me to design my end-to-end -end tests in a certain way, and I think it's a good way. It's very linear since you have a chain. You don't go left and right. You just start at a certain point and then you arrive at a certain point. And I think it's a good design. Of course, it can be sometimes painful because you want to adjust your tests to a certain circumstances. But if you want to do that, I think it actually might be better you don't. You don't create conditionals. You don't create uh, different problems for yourself you don't adjust your test to the application you make sure that the test is always giving you the same result and i think cypress is sort of opinionated tool in that regard and it is going to force you a certain way and some people like that and some people don't and i think it actually if we were to put it on a on a spectrum i think the more control you have over the application the easier Cypress is to use, and the less control you have over it, the 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 more difficult it is to use this this uh, chaining syntax, uh, because you you kind of need to adjust to what the application is doing. But if you have a like, full control over the application, you can sort of create sort of a isolated case for yourself where that test is going to be pretty much straightforward. You arrange your test, you act upon it, and then you make your assertion. Uh, I find that when you have like an e-commerce store or something where the content management is being done outside the application, uh, <coughs> sorry, and you don't really have too much control over that data, then it's going to get like really complicated. Uh, but the thing I wanted to mention, the chaining syntax uh, is has been working for me, but for API testing, it might be kind of hard to to work with because chaining syntax, of course, comes with a, with a problem that if you want to have a variable assigned during the test execution, it's going to be hard. You need to use then command to sort of add this synchronous breakpoint to your, uh, to your test, uh, whether uh, whereas with Playwright, there's no such thing. You can do, you can do uh, create a variable and then just await 
and and wait for that uh, for that response to come. Uh, so the API testing seems like it could be kind of easier in uh, in Playwright. Now I don't know, uh, but it does sound like that. Especially like if you like if you have your API test where you just call an API endpoint and then make sure that the that the response has a certain uh, certain structure or certain data coming back, then that's okay. But as soon as you start chaining a couple of API calls together, for example, like you first call the authorization, then you, <coughs> uh, I don't know, then you get information from the user, then you create some resource, and then you want to delete that resource afterwards. You have four API calls that are sort of connected one to another and reaching, writing that in, in Cypress <coughs> sorry, can be, can, can get you to sort of like the callback hell where you have a couple of then commands or you need to structure your test in kind of a, uh, in a janky way. Uh, I don't know how this looks. This is already kind of complex, but I, I guess this is, uh, oh, this is like a cookie a storage example. So I guess this is kind of a different thing. Yeah, but looking at looking at the earlier examples, I, I got, a, got a sense that it made sense. Oh yeah, this is nice and clean, right? Context post, context delete. Uh, although these chain, these are not really chained together. This is just a bunch of API tests. Uh, okay, so yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Let me know if you want to if you want to dive deep into it. The API testing might be uh, might be kind of interesting. Uh, okay, my voice is uh, is having problems, so I probably wrap it up for today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, this was uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I would like to. <laughs> so it's like a New Year's resolution. I would like to do these every week. Uh, I missed the first week. <laughs> I wasn't working, so that's okay. But uh, yeah, I would I would like to do it more often. And I I know I know I say it every time I do do the stream. Uh, I would really like to like to do this. Uh, I would really like to talk a little bit more uh, about replay. I just briefly mentioned it today. We we're talking more about testing, but. I think it all sort of comes together uh, when talking about testability and different testing solutions and then debugging and all that uh, all that process. Uh, and I would like to see, um, um, yeah, answer your questions or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, I guess I'll see you in a week, hopefully at uh, around the same time. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, or on Discord and I'll be happy to uh, meet you next time. Uh, so thank you everyone and bye-bye.